the Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pope and Young Podcast. Jason Roundsville here, joined with my co-host, Dylan Ray. We have with us from Annihilator Broadheads. We actually have the owners of Annihilator Broadheads with us today. One of our newest corporate partners. Super excited to be talking to The them. newest. The newest corporate partner. So we have Brandon Brody and Micah Brown, the owners of Annihilator Broadheads. Welcome, guys. Hey guys. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for taking some time with us. I know um, we visited a little bit at the ATA show. And I mean, you guys kind of the corner of your booth is this, the hood of a car with what is there a hundred holes in there from a broadhead? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, roughly about, about a hundred per hood. Yeah. Okay. And, and so we we're talking about that and, and, uh, somebody said that all of those holes were made with one broadhead yes sir uh we okay. actually traveled around uh, a lot of the tax last year total archery challenges and uh rather than uh taking all the fun ourselves we let our customers participate and nice handed them an arrow and i said use your bow use our arrow our broadhead and uh shoot into a car head we let kids do it you know from 15 pound bows all the way up to, you know, the guys with 85 pound limbs, right. Uh, you know, blowing their uh, limbs off as they draw back, but, uh, but yeah, it was fun. And, uh, we got up to 200 through between two different car heads with the same broadhead. And then we used the guy who shot the 200th shot, uh, super cool dude. Um, I think his name, was it Gil? Like, yeah. Can't... Gilbert. Yep. Gilbert. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, anyways, uh, we told Gilbert to go, uh, to go send that broadhead into that iron, iron rhino up on the range. And it stuck in using a 485 grain arrow out of the, what was it? 58 pound bow or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. I think like a 58 pound bow. And we, yeah. we did the, the, that broadhead that we shot was a 125 in our uh, original, uh, original diameter. And, uh, Gilbert was a, uh, 100 grain shooter. So he was just South of the six inch or uh, I think it's like a four inch circle for the, uh, to win the truck. Um, he was just South. It had, he had shot a hundred grain broadhead that had been shot 200 times through a hood. He would have been almost dead center. The, uh, the orange spot at 60 yards. After no, that okay. broadhead. Yep. Yeah. We we didn't, we didn't, didn't, because we wanted him to hit the steel to see what would happen with, you know, yeah. relatively right. dead because you know, it's been shot 200 times through car hoods. And, you know, if you actually, you were at ATA, you saw the car head. I mean, it's double gussets, triple gussets. It's, it's not just one small thin piece of metal and it is real steel. And, uh, well, 200 times, same broadhead. And it actually stuck into this quarter inch plate steel. No and kidding. It, we had to get pliers to rip that thing out. And, uh, the cool part was, is you saw it at ATA that that broadhead still spins perfectly. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty and we, cool. And we never, uh, we never touched up either in between all the shots. Uh, we, you know, we had guys that come up and folks, oh, uh, I don't believe it, this and that. And they're like, nope, I shot it, uh, I shot it yesterday. I was number 48 and I'm shooting it again today and I'm number like 67 or number 77. And they're like, no, <laughs> it's the real deal. So, wow. Yeah. That's cool. It's it, it just a more one of those things. We just wanted it to engage people because we knew at those total archery challenges, a lot of guys just, you know, folks stand around waiting to get on the uh, chairlifts and we're like, how can we show people our broadhead, but also keep it entertaining. So we came up with that shooter's box and yeah, toward the country with two hoods and the one, one hood that was at uh, ATA, um, that was just one of two hoods. We, the second hood we used at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, Safari club international, uh, show. So okay, can come up to the booth and say, Hey, there's all this did one. And you know, you want to keep it like that because they don't believe that. And then when you tell them there's two hoods, it's like way over the top. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty great. Yeah. We, I'm trying to think, I think we had a presence at one of the tax shoots, but we do quite a bit with the, uh, the math, the mountain archery festivals, yeah. um, uh, those guys over there take pretty good care of us. And, and 
they have the Pope and Pope and young world record course that they take on tour, which is pretty neat. Cause they've got, you know, replicas representative of all the current world records. So that's for a guy like me, that's the only chance I'm going to shoot a world record. I mean, it's <laughs> some of the stuff I look at and it's, you see the elk and they're just impressive and you just see all of these. And, and even the, you know, the one that surprised me the most, I might've been why it was one of my favorites. It was the pronghorn antelope that it's just like massive. And you're just like that just, you know, you don't think you think of a big pronghorn and a little pronghorn they're They're not that far apart, you know, is of what my brain says. And then, so it was kind of neat to see all those on the mountain, but they didn't definitely didn't have anything where I could shoot through a car hood. <laughs> <laughs> what might be fun is to see if you can shoot a Pope and young animal, uh, after going through a car hood and seeing your penetration into the Pope and young animal. There you go. You know what I'm with my setup now, I might be able to do that. Cause I shot, um, I've had some, some pretty good setups this year. I had a antelope where I, I passed through him and my arrow went farther than the antelope went. And then I just shot a javelina oh, a week or week or two ago. And, uh, that thing blew through it went 85 yards out the other side of him. So, and, and so it's, uh, I might be able to do that right now in the past. I don't know that I could have said that, but right now things are clicking pretty good. There you go. So, awesome. Yeah. So now I want to know, I want to dive a little bit into, cause I know mine and Jason's both, and you probably guys probably get this all the time is that's a tiny little head. Um, mm -hmm. so walk us through, you know, how it, how it creates the channels that it does being how small it is. Sure. Yeah. And that's what we, we kind of, Mike and I go to trade shows all over and obviously talk to guys all over. And, um, our favorite is when we go out East or, you know, to the whitetail markets, cause you get so many guys that walk up and they go, you know, before they even come talk to you, they shake their head and they go, no way, you know, I, I would use that small of a broadhead. And, um, and, and we kind of laugh, but we pride yeah. ourselves with, uh, having a unique design that, um, it's one, it's nothing like anything that's ever been designed before. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to design a broadhead that had a larger cutting surface area. Uh, and we, uh, and we designed it in such a way to, with the efficiencies, the back scoop, um, that we don't require larger cut diameter to achieve holes larger than most, most cut diameter, larger cut diameter heads, if that makes sense. So we wanted to put a hole in an animal and, and you do that uh, with more surface area. And the problem is, is, you know, if you shot like a round ball through an animal out of an archery component, you'd never get the, the penetration, you know, that you'd want, but, you know, a round ball would be a large surface area, you know, you know, shape, right. Going through an animal. Um, if you could core out mass in an animal, and as long as you could use the archery component with the feet per second that they're shooting today to get the penetration, um, anything that's going to core out mass in that animal is going to be what's going to kill it faster time and again. And so, um, you know, we can get into our story of how we got started and all that, if you guys want to dive into that, but the, the long and short of it is, is with that back scoop, we have more cutting surface area in a sub one inch cut diameter than a three inch cut diameter mechanical. Um, and when we pass through an animal, we truly bore a hole all the way through that animal. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's through bone. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, ribs or whatever, that hole is going to stay open and it will not collapse. Um, in fact, as a taxidermist, we hear all the time that those guys are not able to re-stitch and pull that hide back together after mm. an animal was shot. They can always tell you which animal was shot with an annihilator because there's no re-stitching re that back up and closing that hole uh, in the hide. And that's what we want to do. We want to put holes in animals. Um, and we do so very efficiently and effectively. Um, and we want to take all that air inside that cavity of that animal and we want to force it out. Blood loss and hemorrhaging um, and creating lacerations is what every other broadhead does. And 100% of the time with a well-placed shot, you know, well -placed shot, you're going to kill an animal. Um, the difference with our head is, is we're going to do the hemorrhaging, the blood loss, uh, the same or better than anybody else. But we're also going to add steps to lethality because we bore holes in animals. We take the air inside the cavity and we force it out. The faster you can do that, the time of death is going to speed up. And so uh, the typical review that we get from our customers 
is they'll shoot five or 10 animals. And we've got guys that have even shot 35 animals and they all say they didn't go more than 40 or 50 yards across the board. And th this is what we pride ourselves on is animal recovery and how we arrive at uh, more animal recovery is not by bigger cut diameter, which is what the industry has been doing for years. We arrive at that through creating bigger holes, bigger wound channels, forcing air inside the cavity out. So now how did you guys get to, to think of this new, you know, cause you do, you see, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the West coast, I'm in Oregon. So we're a little behind the, you know, times as far as, you know, all the new, um, technology, if you will, in archery, you know, we, we just got lighted knots, not to lighted knocks a, a few years ago. And I think it was two or three years ago, we, we, you know, allowed mechanical broadheads. And so you see, so I'm still shooting a, a fixed three blade because that's what I've shot with, with pretty good results. But what, what takes you guys from looking at, you know, the, the tried and true for 30 years and then, wow, look at these mechanicals who they do, you see some of those wound channels and they're, they're crit. And, and where did this come from that, that you're like, you know what, we need to create a different way of providing lethality for that, for that animal. I mean, where was that concept? Who had that one? That yeah, Jason. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we were actually in elk camp and, uh, this was 2017 through a mutual friend. Um, I didn't know Brandon, but we were sitting there in elk camp and a buddy of ours had, uh, injured a bull, uh, couldn't find it. And, um, we were just sitting there talking and, uh, I was, a, I was in law enforcement for, uh, 16 years. I just recently, uh, recently, uh, quit kind of semi-retired to do the annihilator, uh, annihilator thing full-time. But, uh, when we were in camp, I had, uh, I had a drawing, uh, you know, and I always keep a kind of a go bag and stuff. And if I'm thinking about something, I've, you know, I've worked on a couple other patents and stuff, uh, helping some ideas and bringing some stuff to light, uh, besides broadheads. But, um, I had a drawing that literally I came out of my camper with and, uh, Brandon still laughs. Cause he's like, who, who keeps drawings of stuff like this in their camper, but <laughs> it was in my go bag. Um, but uh, I came out and talked uh, at, it, literally around a campfire. So this is a true campfire story. They were sitting around a campfire. There was three people, including Brandon, one being my mutual friend and one being another friend that we knew. And I showed him a design and I said, hey, look, um, I think this is going to solve a lot of problems. It should it should legitly uh, fly, fly awesome, should penetrate like nothing else, uh, should leave a hole in the animal. So it should we basically should be able to flatten it. Um, and I think it'll actually kill animals faster. And when we, when Brandon and I got it, kind of got it going, um, we had done just a little bit of testing, uh, you know, out of the gate when we, this is before we were even thinking about bringing it to market. This was because, like I said, because a friend had lost a bull, um, when we shot it and started messing around with it, we, uh, through like a sheet steel, through like a barrel, you could see a whole cord out triangle. And then we were shooting some of the best broadheads out there, top, you know, top in the industry, uh, fixed blades. And it was the same thing across the board. It was a, a field point, a little tiny field point hole with razor blade slits. And when you look at the two instantly without knowing what you shot, if you were to just ask somebody, which one would you rather get hit by? They would probably uh, point to the one that has the field point with razor blade slits because the other one is a massive hole. And that kind of piggybacks on what Brandon was saying. Um, the back of that broadhead is designed like a bullet. Um, it is designed to move mass out of the way, create a void on the back of the broadhead where the hide can't touch the arrow shaft and induce pressure systems into animals' cavities that cause them to inflate and deflate when our broadhead hits. Um, so when we launched, we had a, a friend of ours shot one and he shot a pig at 50 yards and it just blew through and blew through the shoulder, shoved meat out the other side. And the pig was dead in like 15 yards. And, uh, I didn't see the shot. He's like, dude, that pig's right there. Like I, it hammered him. And then he, my buddy took it to Africa and these were tiny little prototypes that we first launched with, um, when we were, you know, just designing them. And, uh, he went to Africa, laid the hammer on animals going through the shoulders. And he's basically like, Hey, the pHs were blown away. This thing's not slowing down even when it goes through bone. Um, and that's when we truly realized that that broadhead is moving enough mass to allow the arrow shaft to go through any substrate, whether it's 
wood, um, whether it's steel, whether it's shoulder bone, without having drag on the arrow shaft. And that's truly what does not slow us down. And not knocking other broadhead, broadhead companies, that's what slows down other broadhead companies is the friction on the arrow shaft that we're, we basically removed all of it. So, yeah. Now, I haven't got to shoot them yet, but I saw you, you guys will probably know off the top of your head who did this, but I saw a review um, and somebody shot through a pork shoulder. And they literally just like moved meat out of the way and you could just see a hole all the way through the shoulder. And I'm like, good Lord, that's sweet. Yeah. It, it literally legitly hits like a slug. Um, it, and we uh, piggybacking on Brandon's uh, earlier comment about uh, taxidermists. We I've had butcher shops call us and say that someone had dropped off some meat. Uh, I think one of them was an elk and a couple of were deer. They had, and these were different butcher shops and these are no BS stories. They had called us and said, I almost called fish and game because I, th I thought that this guy was lying and shot this animal with a, with a rifle. Hmm. Yep. So you're almost getting, cause, cause the one thing I've noticed is, you know, there's a, if you shoot something with a, you know, dad's on six, I mean, I don't know how many countless deer, it just puts them on its head. It just tips them over the shock, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, delivers right to them and it just knocks them over right there. And a lot of them never get up. And so yeah. this you're, you're almost creating that shock with this, instead of slicing through, you're, you're creating that shock and that wound channel. Then we're creating a, we're not uh, a bullet in the sense of hitting an animal at, you know, a thousand plus feet per second. Um, so there's no actual shock wave. Hey, you never know. Bows are getting better and better every year. So <laughs> faster well, and faster, right? <laughs> but it, to, be, to be fair, we're towing a fine line with how we talk about bullets and broadheads, right? And, and mm -hmm. you, when we talk about bullets and broadheads, you can almost hear guys' eyes start to roll. And and I want to be very clear because I think it's, it's really important for guys to understand um, our broadhead is designed to change the pressure of air in the cavity of an animal every animal has air in their cavity the second you took a hypodermic needle and you put that into the cavity of an animal if that doesn't repressurize that animal's potentially going to die now a hole the size of a hypodermic needle is you know a, not a very big hole that's a slow cavity leak right um, and so obviously an animal's not running around able to repressurize their system um, but what they can do is as they move, the rib cages move, right? The rib cage was designed to have flexibility to it. And so let's say you have a pencil hole with razor blade slits as your wound channel, and you hit that animal with a, with whether a good shot or a bad shot doesn't matter. But as long as it's in that chest cavity, that animal, as it runs away and it's turning and it's doing its thing, every time it takes a turn, it can repressurize its system. One, especially if there's only one hole. So two holes, it's going to be much more difficult to repressurize your system, right? Um, uh, and then obviously the larger the hole, the more air comes out of that cavity. So our broadhead specifically bores a hole in an animal. It On impact through um, uh, fluid dynamic analysis and all sorts of testing that we've done working with third-party engineers, we can prove a pressure change on impact. In fact, we were able to measure it in a deer we had a five inch pressure wave, compression wave on impact, followed by a almost eight inch low tension pocket, basically hitting them like a hammer um, and then literally sucking atmospheric pressure in through that cavity and forcing whatever materials inside that animal, the blood, the air, all of that out in two different directions. Um, <clears throat> and that's what we do. It's not a bullet where they die from shock wave, um, but it's an air pressure change inside the cavity. And the reason why that matters is because it's like knocking the wind out of you. I mean, how many of us have been, have gotten the wind knocked out of them, but now imagine you can't recover because there's no back pressure in your, in your organs. You can't reinflate your lungs, whether or not you got a lung hit or not, it doesn't matter as long as a hole is in the chest cavity of the animal. And as long as that hole stays open. So let's say you have an arrow that plugs that hole. Okay. Well, now you have a more difficult time to, you know, for that to happen. Right. Again, likely, highly likely still a lethal shot. Um, but it's the difference of an animal running 20 to 40 yards versus 150 to 500 yards. And that's where our broadhead makes the difference in recovery is we often are hearing the story of it didn't go 20, it didn't go 40. 
not just on two animals, on 20 animals, 30 animals, uh, just across the board of the hunters that shoot our heads. And our favorite is when the guy, when somebody shoots our broadhead and they have killed more than two or three animals with it, we don't have to say anything. It, the words come out of their mouth. Um, they see it, it. The recovery is there. When you shoot yeah. one or two animals, there's always those. I mean, gosh, if you've been hunting long enough, there's always bad shots that happen. Animals yeah. move by the time you break your shot off. If you're using our head with a sample size of one or two, absolutely. There's those times where it's not a perfect you know, scenario to be in. But the second you start getting some numbers on your sample size, it's across the board. You, you can't argue with what this head is doing from a um, efficiency standpoint once it comes out of that bow. Well, and I think, you know, you touched on something. If, if you know, I don't know too many bow hunters that, that haven't been around at least one animal getting away. And it's just, you know, it happens with rifles too. It's just part of, part of the program. Occasionally, you know, one's just going to, going to get away. Um, in fact, at ATA, we were actually talking to a gal um, Deb Fern and her, her mission is to get more women involved. And sh somehow she got introduced to bow hunting. She loves it, but she's, as she's talking to women, their biggest fear in life is, is not bears or snakes or mountain lions. It's not anything that you might think of their biggest fear almost across the board. She was talking about is they don't want to wound something. They don't right. want to hit an animal and have it get away. And none of us want that, but apparently with some of the women hunters, that's like a major, that's one of the detriments to them enjoying more of the sport, if you will. I've had my wife in the woods, Jason, and her biggest fear is bears for sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <bears is. laughs> they, uh, they asked me, Jason, when we were talking, um, like, man, we just want to get our head in, in some people's hands that kill a lot of animals. And I'm like, Frank Noska. And, uh, so, so I got Jeez. Frank, uh, some, some broadheads coming. He's excited about them too. He looked at him and was like, dude, these are awesome. He's like, I love the design of them. And so he I told him like, a well, lot Frank of good put, stuff. like, Frank will put down some animals for you for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. When, when, you know, we've had at some of these shows, we've had engineers walk up to us, um, and they kind of almost get a smirk on their face. The guys that understand the mechanics and, and, uh, you know, like, they'll grab the broadhead and this has happened across the board, multiple shows. Um, we've had guy, and it usually happens at every single show. Someone will walk up and literally it's like, they're like, take my money. You guys don't even have to explain. I'm an engineer. You don't even have to explain it to me. So, um, huh. for the, for the, you know, for the bow hunting community, um, to see something like this. And, you know, when we first launched, uh, Brandon and I, uh, you know, we had to take a, we took a lot of flack on social media and stuff. We had guys saying, Hey, I wouldn't shoot a squirrel with that. There's no way it's going to fly. And kept telling you, telling each other, just, you know, just let it go, let it go. Our customers will soon, you know, as soon as they get them in their hands, they'll start speaking for us. And, you know, we launched and won that award at the ATA show, um, for, you know, most innovative product uh, at that, at the ATA show in 2020, uh, we, and, you know, we launched in 2019. Uh, and since then it's just, the reviews have been, you know, you get you every once in a while with short, you know, poor shot placement or something like that. You'll have, you know, you'll have a, a bad review or whatever guys saying, Hey, didn't do this or didn't do that. And, um, we're not saying this is the end all be all, but by all means, this is, we honestly feel it's the most ethical thing you can launch at a, uh, launch at an animal. Because what it does, it's think about it, you know, think about an animal's cavity. Like Brandon was saying, you put it in any broadhead you want, you put it in that pocket, it's going to happen, right? Uh, they're going to expire. But this is the insurance policy broadhead. If you go too far back, um, you have a hole that trace is always going to come. come I've out been of, there. Right? Yeah. I've been and there. And if you go, oh, if yeah. you go too far forward, right? Too far forward. I've been there. <laughs> If you go too far forward, now you have a broadhead that will, does not just try to crack bone. It absolutely obliterates bone, does not allow the bone or the height to suck down on the arrow shaft. Now your penetration increase, talking about, you know, female archers and stuff like that. Now your penetration increase through that substrate has just gone off the charts because now you don't have any friction on the arrow shaft. And guys don't realize that your broadhead is just a tiny portion of the entire projectile. If you were to take a normal standard arrow, which everyone's shooting like the 204 series or, um, you know, something along that lines, you're a half inch around times 30 inches 
of arrow length plus your knock plus your veins. That is a whole bunch of drag that, and like I said, not knocking broadhead companies, that's a whole bunch of drag that every broadhead manufacturer forgot about except for us. We built our broadhead to take the brunt of the friction to get all the friction off the arrow shaft. And that's truly what slows you down. Think about, you know, think about it, like you guys can look and see that hole, right? That, that our logo hole is what we're doing going through any matter in its stagnant form. So if you put, um, a one shot, right? A, a, a single hole into an animal without a double pass through. Now, instead of your field point with little razor blades sucking down in your arrow shaft, not allowing the animal to leak matter out and not allowing the animal to depressurize its system by letting fluid out and air out, our broadhead will sit in a hole only on one hole, not a complete pass through, and allow all that material to still come out because the broadhead's bored a hole all the way through the animal. Yeah, because I mean, it- we've all been on blood trails that just quit it's just you know you know they're there you just need to find them and all of a sudden the the blood just stops for whatever reason so Mm -hmm. here if you've got a bigger hole that's a um that's a better thing i actually started for that reason i shot a couple elk that and i got them both long shots but i shot them high and one of them i watched it i watched go over and lay down and, and expire right in front of me. And there was not one drop of blood between where it was hit and where it died. And, you know, it just happened to be in an open area where you could see it, but if not, you know, uh, you know, other than some of those guys in Africa who can track based on just tracks, a lot of the stuff that I'm in and, and I know some pretty good trackers that, you know, you need that blood verification to make sure you're still on the right animal. Yeah, and uh, if you can keep them bleeding, your your chances of recovery go way up. Now, your example so, of elk is a is interesting because we find elk are, you know, constantly a uh, you hear they shoot for double lung, and a lot of guys think that that's a great shot. And I beg to differ on an elk. I think a double lung is going to work. It's going to kill it for sure. Uh, but if you're a bloodluster and you want to see the most blood, don't shoot the lungs. That's not going to produce you know, anywhere close to the amount of blood as anything close to the arteries and the heart and uh, et cetera. So elk are notorious for that story that you just said, though. They're big animals. Their thoracic cavities are huge. Um, they just bleed inside. Yeah, they bleed internally, yeah. especially especially when you hit that higher. Anything, anything that's uh, uh, above that, you know, top of the, of the one third, the, the further up you go, the less blood you're going to see no matter what you shoot. But yeah. with our heads, we're going to keep a hole. That's for sure. So no, whatever, when I, when you I, eat, whatever you hit, it's it's coming out. The hole staying open. That's for sure. When I first saw the broadhead, I immediately thought to myself, and not that I don't plan on shooting them as well, but I immediately thought to myself, these would be great for my wife uh, because last year was her first year really bow hunting, and I saw both shots, um, and I actually have them both on camera. And both shots were perfect, but we never found either animal. Um, the first time, not great penetration. Second time, I upped her to a 125 uh, grain broadhead. And it looks like better penetration. And, and I'm talking perfect shots. I'm like, babe, th- th- that's dead right in the field. Uh, and neither time we found the animal. Um, and so right when I saw the broadhead, I'm like, yeah, she's shooting these next year. Yeah, when we, you know, shooting through that car hood and stuff, we had low pounded shooters shooting a dull broadhead um, through like through the metal, through double gussets. And um, that just speaks volumes on the head's ability to, you know, we pride ourselves on that. You know, if you're shooting into a target, we'll be we'll be up there with the best of them. Um, and there's a bunch of videos out there, and we you know may we may lose in one substrate or another substrate, but that you know that's all that's all relative to broadhead versus broadhead. But when you put our broadhead um, on an arrow and you actually put it through an animal and you get rid of all that friction, the bone, hide, and viscera that's trying to slow it down, um, the penetration uh, increases absolutely off the charts. Yeah, we had a couple of really cool stories uh, come through. As you can imagine, as a broadhead company, you hear you hear all sorts of stuff that comes through on social and email and stuff. And um, I remember when we first launched, uh, I can't remember if it was 2000, like literally when we first launched or 
right after we won the award, but uh, in 2020. But um, remember that chick, uh, 13 year old girl. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have to correct me on the poundage because it was it was a while ago. But I want to say it was a, a 32 pound bow and uh, a 20 yard shot and a 200 pound hog complete pass through. And yep. her grandfather was just like unfreaking real. Never seen anything like that before. Um, and she now, to be fair to her, she didn't hit a shoulder or a rib. You know, it sounds like she put it right where it needed to be, blew right through that animal. But that hog, you know, didn't go 10 or 15 yards. And when you hear that about a 32 pound bow, 13 year old girl, that, that's pretty cool. It's a, you know, what we would call low pounded shooter, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we got another story from an African safari. I think it was what Apex Gold Safari in South mm -hmm. Africa. And they, uh, they reached out to us. We met them at Gauss the first year we were there in 2020. And um, they got our heads and his wife started shooting those heads. And uh, I guess she killed some animals, seen some good results with them. And uh, uh, they called us up and they or called Micah up and basically said, hey, this lady was shooting, your bro or shooting another broadhead, um, shot a Impala. And uh, I can't remember if uh, they lost the Impala or just mm -hmm. didn't get good penetration, but um, basically it like had three, three to four inches of penetration. Um, did they recover that thing, Micah? I can't remember. No, they lost it, yeah. So they lost the Impala. Um, obviously a bummer, bummer scenario to be in. And uh, so Abex Gold was like, hey, uh, so her dream was to shoot a zebra. And um, she, that's what she went there for. And they're like, there's no way you're going to shoot a zebra if you can't get a you know penetration on an impala right so, um they said uh, she's like doesn't matter like i want to pay for the animal they're like well if you want to if you draw blood you pay um but there's no way we're letting you shoot it with the current setup if you want to try this broadhead you know annihilator broadheads we've had good luck with them my wife has shot animals with them shoot at 40 yards get on target uh show us that you can hit with them um and then you know you pay for the animal no matter what um, and she says okay let's do it 60 yard shot on a zebra complete pass through hmm. zebra, how far did the zebra go micah did you hear that in story? um i don't i don't remember exactly how far it went but the biggest thing was you know the, the fact that she didn't change her arrow she didn't change her poundage she didn't change anything and the increase that's that that speaks to that increase in penetration uh through substrate like that um without changing anything other than the tip that you're using right and that's one story right um, well, I guess two that we just shared. So small sample size, but point is, is anybody who buys our broadheads, <laughs> they go home and the confidence booster happens immediately when they shoot them into their block target and, and they can compare how they're shooting compared to what they normally shoot. Um, often we hear we blow through them. Um, and I tell guys, you know, if you've got an older target, you better have one behind it because you are going to blow through it. Um, and you start to, you start to see it and the story unfolds and it's cool because you'll see it on social guys will reach out and they'll be like, Oh man, just got the package. You know, they hit us on instant messenger or whatever. Uh, just opened them up, shot them. They shoot lights out. Penetration's unreal. You know, can't wait to shoot these into an animal. And then, you know, within a couple of months, it's, I killed a hog or, you know, I shot my first animal with them. Lights out experience. Didn't go 20 kind of thing you hear often. And it's not always the case, but you hear it a lot. Um, and then, you know, the magic happens and people start really writing the reviews and stuff on their second and third animal. And they start to see this, this consistent result. And I think that's the thing that Micah and I, as owners, we get so excited about because that's what we wanted this Brada to do, you know, and it was in Micah's head. And, you know, I just helped take what was in his head and, you know, bring it out. And um, now we get to watch the world, you know, increase animal recovery increase their confidence when they're taking their shots and we tell guys if you're on a hard quartering two shot send it like don't be afraid to send it you're not going to get deflection with our broadhead our broadhead hooks up and it, and it drives and it will continue on the trajectory that you send it on it's not going to change its shape when it hits a bone it's not going to it's going to continue on the trajectory that you send it on because nothing really slows it down um, there's nothing to bend break warp um, in almost every scenario you're going to it's very rare that you don't have two holes in an animal. I'll put it that way. Um, and uh, so the, the, for a hunter to have those results time and again, whether you're uh, a crossbow shooter, a traditional bow, a compound bow, a low pounded shooter, high pounded shooter, 
and you start to see these results across the board, we're changing the industry. We're changing what hunters should expect in animal recovery and what a broadhead should do when they send that downrange. And, and that's something that we, you know, we put our heads on our pillows at night going, that's pretty awesome. We're pretty excited about that. And, and just from, uh, we are hunters ourselves. We were not people that said, Hey, we really want to be in the archery industry. I mean, Micah was a cop before this. He didn't need to leave his job. Um, I was a VP of a software company. I made a lot more money than I do now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, ultimately it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about necessarily the lifestyle. We still got to hunt. We still had everything that we needed. We did this because he had an idea and, you know, I have an entrepreneurship background. And when he shared his idea with me, I've always been passionate about helping others take their ideas from their heads out and try to go to market with something that's awesome. Um, and that's just something that I've always loved. Um, and I'll continue to want to do, you know, and so, uh, when that opportunity came, it was like, Hey man, how can I help you? Let's just call it a project. You know, we'll figure out whether your idea has legs or not. And obviously it does. Right. Um, but it's exciting for us to be a part of it. And, uh, we use our broadheads on a regular basis. We kill a lot of animals with them personally. And for us, they were made for us by us and, uh, you know, um, now we get to share it with the world. So uh, we're stoked about it. That's awesome. Well, we appreciate you being part of Pope and Young as well. Um, you know, as as you know, we're the the voice of of the bow hunter, especially in North America, and and strive to to continue to be that for folks. And and we like to align ourselves with with uh, good companies that are are very pro bow hunting. And so. Um, we appreciate you guys jumping on. So what's, uh, I mean, you've got, so you've got the annihilator broadhead. How many different versions do you guys have? Four, basically we have three, we have two, two versions, uh, two different size, basically two different sizes. We have an original size and, and a, uh, and an XL size. We have a hundred grain original, a 125 original. And then we have uh, this year, we just launched that it's not available for online sales just yet but we have a 100 XL, a 125 XL and a 150 XL. Gotcha. So, so five different kind of five different SKUs, two different, two different size products. Okay. And then what, just for those that maybe haven't seen your stuff, what's the, if you go from say just the middle of the row, like a 125 original to the XL, what's the, the difference in like a cutting diameter? What, what are people looking at there? Is it 10%, 20%? Say, uh, um, so in general, when guys walk up and they ask us what they should shoot or what we would recommend, um, I always break it down to what is your effective yardage you're shooting animals at. And usually that comes down to what animals are you shooting? Um, often, like if you're talking to a Western hunter and they're shooting antelope, they're taking a lot longer shots. If they're shooting, you know, uh, whitetail, they're typically shooting 20 to 30 yards, two very different hunters. Um, you we're from Idaho. This is made for crushing Idaho elk. We okay. take, we take 60 yard shots. No problem all the time on elk. Um, we're in high winds. We're in, you know, uh, uh scenarios where the smallest cut diameter head is going to be our, our best friend. Um, one for wind drift noise, everything. We can shoot our small diameter heads with target veins if we want, um, to quiet those arrows down. And so, um, uh, it's, you know, if you're out West in general, that hundred grain standard and that 125 standard are just awesome heads. They put an inch and a half hole all the way through your animal, no matter what they hit, they fly incredible. We shoot them at a hundred yards with field point accuracy all the time. We've got, a, we've got guys that have even shot them out of Raven crossbows at 150 yards with field point accuracy. So, uh, in terms of long range accuracy, if you're that guy that says, man, I care more about long range accuracy than anything, than just the standards all day long in a 100 or 125. Um, it's a no brainer. And that's a sub cut diameter, a one inch cut diameter head. It's a 0.91 cut diameter, still, still over seven eighths. Seven eighths as a reference would be 0.875. Okay. And, and so, but if you're that whitetail guy or a guy, even if you're on the West, you know, Western hunter, but you're like, hey man, I don't take shots over 50 ever. Um, then there's no reason for you to ever not shoot the XLs because they, they're an inch and a 16th cut diameter. They'll put a two inch hole all the way through your animal, bigger hole, 
more efficient, more effective in every way. And you're not, you're not sacrificing anything uh, for your effective use. Um, and um, now can you use the standard size on Cape Buffalo? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Mm. They've killed Cape Buffalo in under 30 seconds on the hoof um, on camera. Um, so those standards are lights out. Don't think you need more than the standards. Um, but like we started this conversation is most guys go, man, it's a tiny broadhead. Right. So right. Guys, that's, that's, the only reason we, yeah, that's the only reason we actually came up with the XLs. Brandon and I like tooth and nail were every, every day was like, well, dude, what do you think? Think we should do it? Think we should, you know, what, and it's like one of those things that we always tell guys like, you know, 90% of the hunting population lives, you know, east of the, east of the Rockies. We're only 10%, maybe 15% on, on a good year out here out West. And, you know, uh, not knocking the products that are out there, but they've been, uh, a bunch of, uh, marketing has been crammed down their throats and popped in front of their faces, telling him that a bigger cut, larger swinging blade is better than anything else out there. When it's not about that, it's about, uh, efficiency in killing animals and ethically harvesting animals. So, um, we launched the XLs because that, you know, that same guy would walk by at great American outdoor show and no, oh, just too small. You know, it's like a, right. you know, it's a Ford guy. I shoot Ford. My, you know, I drive a Ford. My grandfather drives a Ford. My dad drives a Ford. And now my brother's driving a Dodge and we don't really like him that much. Yeah. That kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting because my mind went the same, same place. Like I, um, years ago, I, sh I shot a certain broadhead and it's just cause you know, I, I had some guys that I trust and they said, Hey, here's the one you want to shoot. And I'm like, okay. And I started off with the hundred grains and that's, you know, what that bow setup was made for. And then I was talking to a guy at a bow shop, pretty knowledgeable guy. And he says, Hey man, he says, those are, those are great broadheads, but he says, why the hundreds? He says, you're shooting, you know, uh, with your setup, you could do more. And I said, I don't know. They shoot good. I never saw the need. And he said, well, you know, gosh, the increase in cutting diameter will help you. You know, if you make a perfect shot, anything's going to work, but yeah. when you're just a little bit off. And so my brain instantly went there to where that's why I switched to a 125 is to get that wider diameter. And I mean, I, I could shoot to 70. I rarely, rarely do that on an animal but yeah. um yeah it's it's that mentality it's it's once you get it in your head it's it's tough to switch even if it's a not necessarily a better mousetrap but a, a different mousetrap it's working in a different way instead of just you know the the big slice you're you're actually doing something something different so well and think about it this way like if you just ask people this question would you rather have an inch and a half cut of a traditional broadhead or would you rather have an inch and a half hole? Same cut, yeah. right? But one, one cores out the remaining material within that inch and a half, right? right. Everyone well, was... choose the one that cores the inch and a half hole out, right? Yeah. If you, just, if you just said that, now close your eyes and hold out your hand and then gave them the annihilator, they would probably, you know lose it when they look at it, how small it is and goes, now, how does that happen? And then we have to explain it, but everybody would choose the, the inch and a half coring out the hole. And so right. detail guys, going back to your question is, do you shoot the standards or do you shoot the excels? Um, our recommendation is for most guys over who want to take shots over 50, shoot the standards for most guys that want to take all uh, the, the vast majority of their shots under 50, you can shoot either or. Um, but the XLs are going to be uh, a little more forgiving, a little larger hole um, every time, no matter what you hit. And the reason why we say 50 yards is um, our XLs have more cutting surface area, larger cut diameter. Um, and so uh, there's more um, lift that's actually generated on the front of that broadhead. And contrary to, to how guys think arrows fly, um, if you don't match the lift generated on your broadhead with the lift in your veins, you don't have proper flight. And so you'll start to see drop out to longer ranges with larger broadheads. And you won't see a left to right variation with our heads at any range. If you ever see that, you need to walk back to your rest or check your spine. Um, but as long as those, those two things are, are correct, our broadheads are going to left and right fly phenomenal for you at any range. Um, but out past 60s where we um, 
we start to see drop for those XLs. And so especially on slower arrow speeds, any slower arrow speeds always going to drop, you know, the bigger, the brighter it's going to drop. Right. Um, and so it's just a general rule of thumb for gosh, 99% of guys, you're not going to see drop at 50. So we just say 50 and under is dialed. If you like to tinker with your veins and you don't mind switching your setup, man, we've got guys that shoot those excels at hundred yards and they love them. Um, uh, I personally shoot the XLs at 70 yards, at least my setup last year. I'm tinkering with a new arrow setup this year, new veins. And so we'll see where I'm at. I haven't shot them yet this year uh, out of my new setup. And so, uh, but my, you know, standard, standard heads are flying out to hundred for me with field points. So, um, so are you, are you going, when you mentioned the veins, are you going to a bigger vein or, or tell me about that? Yeah. So in general, if you want to generate lift, there's a couple things that you can do. And if you understand how veins work, you'll understand that there's like drag, there's lift, there's the weight associated with it. Right. Um, and then obviously the shape and just the volume of drag lift, and et cetera. And so uh, in general, a broadhead vein will be over what's called the vapor barrier, which is at 0.38. So a broadhead vein will be higher than 0.38 tall. Most target veins are 0.38 and under. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, over the vapor barrier, call it 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to 0.5 is your standard broadhead vein. Blazer, most of them are 0.5. <clears throat> and in terms of height, um, you can also go with a longer, like a three inch vein or two threes. Uh, anything over a two inch is gonna help create more, more of that lift. Um, mm. And then I always recommend trying to find a lighter vein. A lot of guys think they want to go with a four fletch and we can talk helical in a minute, but a four fletch is going to give you more weight on the back and it, and it doesn't always counteract and generate the lift that you want, um, especially if you're doing helical. Um, and so helical, a lot of guys don't realize helical will speed up your arrow off your bow for, for greater stability out of the gate. So if you're shooting indoor leagues, it's a phenomenal setup to go with a helical, a hard helical, because you're going to speed up that arrow. But the second you want to shoot long range, it's going to fall faster. Its rate, its retardation rate is going to, is going to increase at longer, longer distances. So it's actually going to drop for you faster. So the more offset and helical that you have, the, 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 your arrow is going to fall faster at further ranges. And so if you're trying to get more lift and get more distance, go with a straight fletch or a smaller offset or less helical, and you're mm -hmm. going to carry that arrow further. And so you can play with your veins to do that. So a great configuration would be a, any lighter vein. If you've got a vein that's four grains, five grains, um, maybe even six, that's always going to be good. They, there's a lot of heavy veins out there. Um, and I don't like knocking vein companies by any means, so I won't list them because um, there's a lot of great vein companies, but there are some heavy veins out there. Um, I'd probably shy clear of anything that's, you know, seven, seven grains per vein and up. Um, and then uh, I would definitely recommend a three fletch over a four fletch and play with them yourself. But what you're going to see, yeah, I can solve it for you. You're going to see a straight fletch is going to carry that arrow the best um, at the long range. If your goal is long range accuracy, um, then a straight fletch is going to give that to you in a flatter trajectory every single time. So. I got to change up all my fletchings because all mine are four fletched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of guys, a lot of guys shoot four fletched. Fletched. It's, it comes down to your effective range. So when you screw on a, an annihilator XL and you're the, and you are that one guy that says seven yards and in. Yeah, there you go. Uh, if you're the guy that goes, Hey, I want a hundred yard accuracy and I want to shoot the annihilator XL. It's possible. Right. <laughs> um, or I'd say 70 to 70 to hundred you might see drop at 60. Micah sees, what are you, 20 inch draw, Micah? Yeah. And arrow speeds were right around that 270 mark, I think. I can't remember, but. Yeah, uh, just south of there with the prototype bow, yeah, slower he bow. Was, he was shooting and getting drop about 60 yards. My bow was a little faster than his, a uh, little, I think we had similar arrows, but, um, and I have a longer draw, that's why I'm 29 inch draw. And I started seeing drop out of my arrow setup at 65. Well, the second I took all the helical out and I went to a straight fletch and <laughs> I'm not going to recommend the blazer, but the, because they're loud, but the blazer vein, I was just doing testing because I wanted to see what a traditional standard fletch would, would do. And it rose six inches at, at 65 yards for me. 
just by putting a straight fletch blazer vein on in three three vein configurations. So uh, that's pretty significant. Six inch drop at you know sixty five yards is a big drop. And so in general, we tell guys 50 and under for the XLs, but man, you can play with your veins and have some fun with it. You might get them flying at 75 for you. You might get them flying at hundred. It just depends on your setup, your aero speeds, your aero mass, which veins you have, whether or not you've got helical. So there's just a lot that goes into it. And a lot as well is comes down to spine and front of center. And a lot of guys don't realize how important spine is they're sending arrows down range that are flapping like this, you know, their, their variance on their pitch and yaw is like six inches because they're way under spined. And so when they, um, as they're flying they're, they're the efficiency in flight isn't there. And so, um, the other thing to consider too, is, uh, just the point weight, you know, um, you want your point pulling your arrow, not your arrow pushing your point. And in general, a really good way to test if you have enough front of center on your, on your arrow is actually just to throw it. If you take it like a javelin and hold it like a javelin and just throw your arrow, if it falls flat, you don't have enough front of center or you're losing efficiency in flight and penetration and you get any wind and your arrow is floating. Um, and that's just, uh, what Brandon's talking about. That's just for just, you can test that with just, just your field point. It has nothing to do with a broadhead or anything. That's just for raw arrow flight. Mm. Yep. And then on impact into an animal, or even you can see it yourself in a target, a really fun thing to do that Mike and I have done in the past is we shoot uh, lighted knocks are illegal in Idaho, unfortunately. So, uh, but when we travel to like whitetail country and stuff, Oklahoma, uh, we did a, a, a nighttime shoot where we were watching arrow flight and we wanted to see a couple things. One, how our arrow flew in the air, like whether it was, uh, we, so you could see the pitch and yaw tight, tightening down. Cause we actually both, uh, stiffened our spines to two fifty spines. Um, mm-hmm. and we were kind of testing some of our theories. And of course that happened where we saw it tighten up. Our groups tightened up. It was awesome. So the aero flight got better. And then the cool thing was, is anybody can do this too, is on impact into your target. If you don't have a lot of FOC, your arrow is still going to be doing this in the target. It's not driving through and stopping and minimizing the shake that happens, which shows you in the same arrow mass that you lost penetration efficiency compared to if you were able to increase your your front of center, you would be way more efficient to drive that arrow straight forward um, because it, it's just a, it's a efficiency uh, with front of center, you're changing your pitch and yaw. And so going back to like the variability on the pitch and yaw on that center point of gravity, if yours is five or six inches versus mine's like two or three, now I'm way more efficient. If all things were the same and all you do is change your front of center, you're increasing penetration, you're, you're, you're bucking the wind better and your, your stability and flight just in general is better. Uh, Basically I just need to pack up all my stuff and send it out so you can, can test all that. Yeah, and we're not we're not ta- we're not saying that uh, you know by any means that our um, that our heads uh, don't fly well because across the board everyone absolutely is one of the first things we get they're like dude these things are unreal I should have listened to you guys I should not have uh, at sixty yards I shouldn't have taken them out of the package and shot groups because now I'm tearing my tearing my fletchings right. up and everything else what we're talking about and Brandon and I spend so much time and this is one of the things that our customers really enjoy when they come and meet us in person is we we take the time to talk to them first about aero flight and aero spine before we even get into our broadheads and we've had guys at the total archer challenge we'll um you know we'll get a group of guys and they're like oh yeah you know so and so is he's spot on at 20 30 and 40 but at at the longer ranges he's uh you know, he's uh, six to seven inches out consistently to the left or right. And the first thing Brandon and I look at each other and we're like, dude, he didn't either walk back to his arrow rest or he's uh, under spine. And then that guy usually will step up and say, well, what do you mean? We'll walk through the whole process of what his bow is doing. And literally just by a couple tweaks, he can go out there with his field points. And we've had guys do it at the Total Archer Challenge, shoot one day, they're all over the map we'll take their setup and just tweak it a little bit for them, have them go shoot at the practice range, then go shoot the next day at TAC and they'll come back to our booth and they're like, dude, you guys, why didn't my, why didn't my bow shop tell me this? And it's like one of those things, it's like, well, not knocking a bow shop, but a lot of times they just kind of want 
we want to get you in there, get you out, get you squared away on paper, but paper only shows you what your bow is doing at five feet. It's not telling you what your bow is uh, doing with that arrow, throwing it at 70, 60, 70, 80, 100 yards. So um, we'll talk to guys about arrow spine. Uh, we'll talk to them about walk back tuning. Um, and that's one thing that, you know, we'll preach, preach to guys is don't, don't be scared in bumping up your spine for, for, for hunting, hunting, uh, hunting scenarios. The less, the less that arrow is flexing, which Brandon is talking about pitching and yawing up and down and side to side, the more efficient that is at driving through an object. So, um, for a compound bow specifically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's not, you know, it's not like versus a traditional blow where it, you know, it's coming off the, because you're rolling, rolling the uh, string with your fingers, but, um, yeah, for most guys, you get get your spine up right and don't just switch to a 125 because you want more front of center. That always doesn't work in your favor because if you're under spined and you add a 120, you go from 100 grain to a 125, now you're severely under spined because you just weaken that spine by putting more front weight on and now your arrow is going to fly even worse. So spine up, choose the right broad, choose the right broadhead you want and um, ours, ours will get the job done for you. I yeah, can tell you, I'm going to be shooting the the 125 XLs out of my recurve. That's uh, I got my awesome. got my bow tuned up to shoot good with 125. So, I'm anxious to screw them on and see what they do. Oh, they'll yeah. be like that for you. You'll love them. Yeah, we tell guys too. Don't don't change your arrow setup based on the information that we share with you until you're ready to change your arrow setup. Like when you're just talking broadheads and you're like, you know, and you just want to do an apple to apple comparison. Just pick the stay with what you currently shoot. If you currently shoot 100 grains, stick with 100 grains. And then get a pack, shoot them, test them, put them through, the, through some animals. That way, the broadhead test that you're doing are, is just the broadhead test, right? Um, but when you're ready to to flip the bill for new arrows, which are not cheap, right? Then start considering changing your spine, your point weight, and really getting the optimal arrow for your type of hunting um, and for for what you're trying to accomplish and spine uh, our opinion at annihilator is you can't be uh over spined i mean mm. i would put female shooters in pretty stiff spines um from all the testing that we've done um, but it's way too easy to be under spined um the other thing i would tell you is don't go off the spine charts from the arrow companies they just don't include a lot of point wave with that they're not that accurate spine 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 I say want to spine down or spine up, but it depends on actually which arrow manufacturer you go to where that would make sense. But the point is, is go with the stiffer spine. So. Well, that's, man, I'm going to have to go back to school and do some more learning, but Hey, (laughs) you know, I'll tell you what, one, uh, you know, one of the questions that we ask everybody on this show guys, and, uh, and you're not getting out of it is when you find yourself on the mountain, um, up in Idaho or, or back in a tree in Wisconsin, wherever you might be, what is one piece of gear, maybe a non-traditional type item that you find your, in your packs? Hmm. I carry a drag rope with me. Oh, the confidence. I like that. <laughs> oh yeah. Out West. I carry, uh, uh, our, we shoot those extendable stabilizers, so I carry the the, the glassing bino platform that uh, I can use, so I don't have to carry a spotting scope or a tripod with me if I want to glass something uh, long range out west. Okay, so that's the crossover stabilizer, right? Yep. Yeah, I shoot yeah. the crossover as well, but uh, I use the glassing platform less. But that drag rope has uh, has been something uh, I've I've enjoyed, and I find myself using using quite a bit. I always carry like paracord and stuff, but yeah, drag rope is just nice to have. So, you know, I've had a drag rope in my pack for a long time and I've just either been somewhere where, where I had to cut it up or, or, you know, you could throw it in a cart or in the truck or whatever, or just, just drag it out by hand. Cause it wasn't going very far. And then last year in Wisconsin, I kind of took a different pack cause I was flying and, uh, Man, a drag where it sure would have been handy, but it was one of the things that got left in the gun room at home. So, yeah, that's good. Well, guys, um, you know, very for me, it was very informative because I'm I'm always trying to learn and and find out more about this. And 
And I think there's, I think you can do it for years and years and never know it all, but, uh, I'm, I'm always trying to learn. So thank you guys for, for jumping on here with us. Uh, thanks for being part of Pope and young and, uh, can't wait to, to see you up on the mountain somewhere. For awesome. sure. No, thank you guys for the invite. We, uh, we appreciate it. So, all right. Well now, now I just have to find out if I need the regular or the Excel. So that's <laughs> my, uh, that's the, you know, my goal is to figure that out by Friday. Yeah. So, Hey guys, well, you guys, you, so uh, much. you guys should be getting them, you know, definitely. Um, and so you guys can, like I said, just test them out and shoot them. And, and you know, like I said, don't, don't be afraid to put them through the ringer and shoot stuff that you normally wouldn't shoot to, uh, to validate for yourselves. What we were talking about, a cool thing that you guys can do, um, and something it's cheap and it's easy to do, uh, kind of piggybacking on what we were talking about earlier, shoot, uh, hang, hang a, hang a water bag up and measure a mark on a, uh, on a heavy duty plastic bag. And, um, you know, uh, uh, like a trash bag or something like that, that can hold water and, uh, measure a mark and shoot whatever broadheads you want into it. And, uh, kind of proving the theory of what that head's doing is, uh, when you screw that, uh, broadhead on even our littlest one, our original size broadheads in the 100 or the 125, shoot them against your, you know, your monster mechanicals, shoot them against a big two blade or whatever you want. And you're going to see that that little broadhead will drain that bag faster than any broadhead in the world. Um, due to the pressure increases and that for yourself, you can see it. That's, uh, that's uh, something people can do quite easily without damaging anything. Just make sure you obviously you have a target behind you and uh, yeah. yeah, let them rip. Awesome. Hey, you see the cavitation. If you, uh, if you film it in a video and slow it down, you'll actually see all the air bubbles, the wound channel, everything. It's pretty rad shooting in water. More fun. That's, but that's yeah. cool. Well, guys, yeah. I, you know, I may go try that. So do it. I appreciate it. Have a great day guys. And, uh, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank okay. you guys. Yeah. Okay.